This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Welcome back, Christopher. Oh, it's good to be back. What's your middle name? James. What was your guess? He's look at him. I can like see the steam You're, like coming out of his ears uh, right now. He is churning on some joke right now. Churning. A charning. Charning. Yeah. <laughs> Have I told you about our in-home currency? They're charns and each one is a charn. They're little pirate coins, but we will hoard them to our kids for good behavior. It's kind of backfired on us though, because our three-year-old doesn't really, I guess, understand it. So, so he has like 40, which is more than you can buy anything on our family store list from. Warren Bucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's holding on for dear life. So <laughs> He's waiting for some NFTs to drop. <laughs> He's got the hodl hands. Let it go. Oh, Chris, last week, Andrew and I either lost every listener on this podcast or we all had a good time together. And I'm not sure there's an in-between. Paul gave you some praise. So, I mean, it had to have been, yeah. had to have been good. But right? what Paul heard was like the episode, our opinions on like what we said, like he doesn't know like if those are right or not, right? <laughs> So like he, okay. he heard uh, the episode, but he didn't hear like me, me making some hard takes on some stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was intense. There was at some point where I didn't know if I should stop Andrew, but I just, I just let it go. A real frozen moment. Andrew, I can see you're confused. Frozen was a movie. Yeah, I, I know. called frozen. Let It Go. Okay. I just, I wasn't listening. I didn't hear you say Let It Go. So then when you said that, I was like, wait, did he say Let It Go? Let It Go. Yes. We should see if Paul can auto tune that, put it on a repeat to like be our intro <laughs> one day. Instead right. of that, like, welcome to Remote Ruby, it should just be <laughs> like a T paint, let it go on repeat. Let it go. Let it go. I was trying to explain to someone the other day. I think you were on the call. I think it was uh, you, Seb, and I, and trying to explain that we used to record on a YouTube live that we didn't brought. Oh yeah. We just use it for the recording feature. Yeah. Well, yeah. How many levels of compression are you going to do? If you go first into YouTube and then into your podcast thing. Oh, we didn't even do that. I use YouTube to MP3. Oh, the MP3 from it. Damn. I mean, this is the, the no code solution. That episode is embarrassing. And because like, I guess when people subscribe, they're like, oh, I want to like start there. It has a lot of downloads and then they immediately tank. Really when I guess Andrew joined and we like started being more professional, the numbers start picking up again. So <laughs> that's a statement no one has ever said. Andrew joined and the professionalism rised. <laughs> Raised. <laughs> Pros. There we go. <laughs> you get there one day. <laughs> is... A play, a musical. A Ooh. musical is a play. There we go. All right. So let's move on. We have a return guest today and someone that has gifted our community with a static site builder and just overall fun energy. So I would like to welcome Jared White back to the show today. Well, thanks. I hope I bring some fun energy today. And actually, I want to thank you. I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've ever been a repeat guest. I'm guessing I didn't make too much of a faux pas of any sort last time. <laughs> or maybe that's why I'm back. Who knows? brought you back for the drama. Yeah, the controversy. <laughs> no one can see it because they're listening, but you have a hat on with a ruby that says this is the way. Like, I have that same hat. Where does this come from? How do I get one? Well, if you happen to guest on the Ruby on Rails podcast, you may get this as some gift swag. I was very surprised and happy to have this. <laughs> yeah. When they released their first episode on their new feed, I wrote up like a really in-depth review and discussion around it and published it. And they sent me a gift box. I guess I recorded too soon because mine was a while ago. I didn't get a hat. It might have been before The Mandalorian came out. I guess if you host the Ruby on Rails podcast and you happen to listen to Remote Ruby and you can sense the sadness, I wouldn't be upset with a hat. 
Are you gonna at least offer something in return? I don't want that happening anymore. I I can't I can't I can't go into any more debt. I have too much debt already. Jared, shout out to the Unreal's podcast, though. Yes, shout out, Jared. You want to give yourself a little quick intro, just for people who may not have listened to that last episode, which we will link in the show notes. Yeah, so I'm Jared White. I'm at Jared C White on all the relevant dev social places. I've been a Ruby developer since. Around 2008, got into Rails, of course, as part of that, and was a Rails developer for quite a long time. Well, still am. Also, in that time, I somewhat reluctantly, but it's it's also been interesting, and become a React developer and done a bunch of different front end stuff. And yeah, also in 2016 started playing around with this little static site generator that was starting to make a splash called Jekyll. And the really cool thing about that was, is it was Ruby based, uh, but it was also liquid based. And the funny story is I'd started using liquid already for a content management system kind of thing I had created myself. So that was like a rails CMS and use liquid for the templates. So that project, kind of didn't go anywhere, but in the midst of me figuring out how to port my personal site and blog to something else, I realized that, oh, if I just take my liquid templates and make a few tweaks, they'll just work in Jekyll, (laughs) which was really cool. So I started using that. I started doing a bunch of client projects using Jekyll for their sites and did some interesting things where their public site was based on Jekyll. And then they had some like back office kind of stuff with database entry and things like that as a Rails app. And I'd kind of wire the two together. But doing that, I mean, it was nice that it was all Ruby based, but there wasn't really anything in particular about Jekyll that made it easier or more intuitive as a Rails developer as well. They kind of seem like they're living in separate universes. And going into really the last three to four years, kind of felt like, you know, the ship was sailing. <laughs> there are all these new tools coming along like 11 and and of course, React-based tools like Next.js and Gatsby and there's just a whole bunch out now in the world of static site generators and kind of front end focused website frameworks. And it kind of got to the point where I was like, it's hard for me to justify using Jekyll for new projects and to tell clients this is the way when it seems like Jekyll is kind of stagnating. And there's all these new tools coming out that can, in some ways, do lots of cool stuff that is maybe hard to do with Jekyll. So I really came to a crossroads there thought about what I could do for my business and for my own projects. And basically that's, that's how Bridgetown got born. <laughs> it was out of this place of frustration and trying to figure out what to do. And rather than adopt some other tool, I ended up on this crazy path of forking Jekyll as of course it's an open source project. And so that was spring of 2020. I suddenly had all this free time on my hands because I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> So it's like, okay, I have more free time here to fiddle around with code. So um, forked Jekyll, created Bridgetown. And since that time, a lot of the code base actually has gotten either heavily refactored or completely rewritten. So I still think of it sort of conceptually as, yes, it's a fork of Jekyll, but it's also really taken on an identity of its own. And there's a, just a whole ton of features that are either different than Jekyll or just completely new and completely unique to Bridgetown. And a lot of that stuff is where I'm the most excited about where Bridgetown is headed and and where it can go. And and also just seeing all the different projects other people are now building with Bridgetown and seeing how they're pushing the envelope. And there's been a really nice feedback loop there, particularly in the last year where people are really creating some cool stuff and then coming back with ideas or questions or even submitting PRs, submitting issues. It's just so exciting because that's the magic of open source. And this is really the first big project I've ever been a maintainer of or has been a steward of. So yeah, it's just been, it's been a really gratifying thing to do. I don't believe it was only 2020 when you forked that. It feels like it's, I don't know. Yeah. It feels like a lot longer. Way longer. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Before we get too deep in this episode, I do want to say that like if any of what we're about to talk about sounds really cool, you should go on GitHub and sponsor Jared 
which you can access via the Bridgetown or it's Jared C. White on GitHub as well, right? Yep. Yep. And you should sponsor him for his work. I've been sponsoring him for like almost two years, it feels like, and you should do it because he's been doing great stuff with the community. And I think pushing the envelope on ways to adopt Ruby, I think is what we should all be supporting right now. So now that's out of the way. It's been two years almost, and Bridgetown 1.0 is almost here. How does that feel? Feels really good. <laughs> yeah. 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 We've just wrapped up a fundraiser that started, I think, right at the end of fall last year. And that was really, it wasn't even exactly my idea. Someone else suggested it because I was kind of grumbling about it. There was just a lot of work to you know really get 1.0 kind of to beta status and finally to production status. And I just wasn't able to kind of justify the amount of time I would need to put in kind of to do a sprint, well, to do a few sprints <laughs> worth of work to get this going. And someone suggested, well, why don't you just raise some funds for this specific effort? And so, yeah, so that went really well, raised several thousand dollars actually. And it was almost all like just small donations from individuals. So this is directly people speaking with their wallet to say, yes, this is interesting and I want to support it and go for it. So that was fantastic. Really did help me carve out some time. I work as a freelancer. So for me, time is literally money. <laughs> so I love working on open source, but I can't do it as much as I would like to, but this really helped me to put in some long hours to, to get a whole bunch of stuff out the door. So yeah, 1.0 is about to go to final production ready, final 1.0 release. That's really exciting. Some of the most recent features I think will appeal to a lot of people. So one of the things that Bridgetown did that Jekyll doesn't do is it made an opinionated decision about how to offer a modern front end build system. So initially we adopted Webpack because it kind of seemed like the de facto option. But pretty recently, it seems like there's been this massive perception shift of going from at least some people saying Webpack is pretty cool to like, Ugh, Webpack. <laughs> like the, the brand of Webpack has lost its luster. And there's various other options out there for what it comes next. But I think a lot of people have have gotten really positive impressions and it's been borne out as people test different things out by ES build. So the nice thing about ES build is at its core, it's a go based binary. So it just runs really fast and runs pretty much anywhere. And there's virtually no dependencies there. It's just, Hey, here's a command line tool. It's ES build. You can run it. And there is a JavaScript API as well. So if you do have node and you just write a little bit of code, you can sort of construct your own bespoke build pipeline using ES build. And that's essentially what we ended up doing with Bridgetown is rather than get rid of Webpack or say, if you want to use something else other than Webpack, go use ES build and have fun. We basically created an integration just like we had done with Webpack that uses ES build and kind of provides that bespoke configuration for you. So out of the box, Bridgetown new, my site, you get an ES build configuration. It kind of just works for the basic things you likely want to do. And then if you end up wanting to set up some additional ES build plugins or run your own transformations for some new language you want to transpile to JavaScript or whatever crazy things that some people inevitably end up wanting to, to play around with, it's all ready to go there. And that's really exciting to me. I've migrated a few projects from Webpack to ES build and have noticed a little bit of a speed up, not a whole lot, just because. A lot of the projects I've used with Bridgetown and Webpack weren't doing too much outlandish stuff on the front end, but it is a nice speed up for the build. And but more importantly, like way fewer dependencies. <laughs> so it's like, oh, we don't have like these 10 dependencies of all these Webpack plugins and Babel and this and that. And we have to like figure out how to upgrade all the time and like, oh, this thing broke here over in this one dependency. So now all these other dependencies, like the newer versions won't work. So we have to pin the versions and it just, that kind of ecosystem churn was just becoming a nightmare. And the ES build based pipeline is just so much simpler. So I think it's really going to be a win. And that's now the default. So out of the box, Bridgetown 1.0, we'll use ES build as the default. And you can, with an option, use Webpack if you need to, or if you need to, you know, continue using some stuff that you've been using on previous projects. But yeah, I think it's going to be a, a good step forward. And I hope kind of a stable step 
I really can go for several more years now without ever touching a front end build <laughs> pipeline. Like I'm so over it. I just want it to work and I want to be able to write my code and get on with things. So I'm hoping I'm crossing my fingers here that this is, this is the way to go. I think you just jinxed yourself though. I think you're going to have to start using my new jQuery based build pipeline <laughs> for JavaScript. And we're just going to like take it and force you to use coffee script and jQuery. And I'm going to try well, and it's old as new again. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Or maybe we go way back to like prototype JS or whatever. Nice. You remember, like, it's hard to believe that Rails had Scriptaculous at one point, I think. And that feels Bring like... Bring back Mutura. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else has been new in Bridgetown since like we last talked? It doesn't seem like it was that recent, but also like you couldn't have been that long ago if you started. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the last time I talked with y'all, it was kind of like a lot of hand wavy hypothetical kind of like, and we'll be able to use ERB templates and we'll be able to use view components and we'll be able to do this and that. And it'll be really exciting and yada, yada, yada. And, and that's all basically happened now. We have a full complement of template options available. So the initial configuration when you install Bridgetown is to use Liquid, but you can easily create a new site and specify you want ERB or even Serbia, which is this other template language that I've basically created to kind of bridge the conceptual gap between ERB and Liquid. So if you want to really kind of be out there on the edge, <laughs> you can check that out. But yeah, they're all first class citizens. Bridgetown now has a, its own component layer. So you can basically create your own subclasses of Bridgetown component and basically use those for all sorts of things from rendering post excerpts to nav bars to cards in a grid layout, like all the kind of things where you want to sort of have like nice isolated component templates and logic. You can do all that. But we also have a shim for view component. It's really kind of like an ecosystem compatibility thing there where if you're building a Bridgetown site, but you also want to use some kind of component system that you want to share with Rails or you've already built on a Rails app and you want to port it over to Bridgetown or whatever, we have this little shim that will enable that. And view component, they constantly working on it and making it better and adding new features. So there may be times when we have to scramble a little bit to ensure the compatibility there, but it's definitely something that we're going to have as a priority over time. And then, yeah. And then beyond that, I think the other sort of marquee feature that is rolling out with Bridgetown 1.0 is kind of this idea of dynamic routes or essentially what does it mean to have a static site that is easy to build, easy to deploy, but also has a few routes that are essentially server side rendered dynamic routes. And depending on how you deploy your project, render is kind of the the poster boy here, because it's so easy to get this set up, you can essentially have two services. You have your static site service where your content gets built and deployed and it's on the CDN and it's really fast and it's free, essentially. So that's awesome. And then you have a second service, which is a actual web server that handles these routes. And so you can kind of punch a few holes through your static routes and say, okay, at this particular endpoint, it's not actually going to pull in a built static file, but it's going to actually connect to this web server under the hood. And under the hood, that web server can do things like provide logins, provide content behind a paywall, can handle payments, can like do all these sorts of things that you might want to add to a site kind of after you have all your initial static content built. And it's kind of cool to be able to do that. Like for the Bridgetown fundraising site, we had the the main static page that you can go to and you can click you know donate and the modal comes up and all that stuff's just part of that static page. But as soon as it needs to talk to Stripe to get a payment intent and provide that to the Stripe JavaScript library and all that, there's a dynamic route to handle that. And it just works. <laughs> it's so easy to write. Like I think the the file, the dynamic route file that handles getting that payment intent set up is just mere lines of code. And some of the magic behind the scenes here of, of how we did that was to pull in Rhoda. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Rhoda, but in a way it's a competitor to Rails, maybe more a competitor to Sinatra for a lot of people who use it. 
but it's a Ruby based web framework. It's just sits on top of rack and you can create this really nice kind of dynamic routing tree with a really cool DSL to just kind of say like, okay, at, at slash foo, you know, you can get slash bard, you can post to slash baz and you can have these different routes with different parameters and, and you can kind of write that all out in one file. And each of these little routes is just a block where you can look at the incoming parameters, do something, output some JSON or whatever. And, and just, it's just really nice, concise way to do things. And when I initially came across Rota and I was looking at that, it was like a brainwave moment for me because one of the cool things that is uh, a lot of people are into now in the static site generator scene and with a lot of the JavaScript frameworks are these uh, things called serverless functions. It's all about serverless functions and you're writing these little functions to handle some of these dynamic routes. And for me, I've always been skeptical of how well that can scale and some of the limitations there. And with Rhoda and what I was looking at with how it could work with Bridgetown, it seemed like kind of the best of both worlds for me where, hey, here's something that's Ruby based. It sits on top of Rack, all the compatibility stuff that enables with Rack compatibility. It's all there. You can deploy that web server anywhere. You can use Nginx on a Linux VPS. You can use Render. You could use Heroku if you wanted to. This will deploy anywhere because it's just like if you're deploying a Rails app or any other kind of Ruby web app. But the way you can write all these little routes feels more like you're writing these little serverless functions that are, you know, really small and concise and kind of easy to do for the simple things you want your site to do. Long story short, that's kind of where we're headed with Bridgetown is to keep working on, um, you know, there's, there's some functionality there now, but to just keep working on this idea of you can have a static site, but then you can start to add some routes And you can dynamically re-render content. An example there might be like you have a bunch of products and most of the product content is static. The description and the color of the t-shirt or the type of wood that the thing's made out of or like all this stuff that's not going to change regularly, if ever. But the price might update or the, you know, if it's in stock might update. So you can have those static product pages and then these little bits of information like the price or the whatever can get pulled in through a dynamic route in real time. And that kind of stuff is just something that you really need to be able to do for a lot of different types of websites. And if you're using something that's just purely a static site generator, like say Jekyll, you might start building these product pages and then, well, how do I dynamically pull in data? And, you know, unless the answer is, you just write some JavaScript and connect to some other API somewhere, whatever that is, you're kind of stuck. So we're trying to, we're trying to create a best of both worlds development experience. Do you need webhooks in your application and wish your webhooks were as intuitive as Stripes? It's a lot more than just sending a JSON payload to your customer's URL. Hook Relay to the rescue. It handles both inbound and outbound webhooks for your application. It records what was sent or received so you and your customers can diagnose when things go wrong. Speaking of things going wrong, webhooks are automatically retried with exponential backoff so you're not overwhelming the receiving servers. No matter what happens, you'll have the peace of mind that your webhooks will be delivered. With Hook Relay, you get to save time while also having powerful, scalable webhook processing that the experts maintain for you. Go to hookrelay.dev to get started and check webhooks off your to-do list. Have you ever thought about using like a turbo frame for the little snippet of HTML that you want to lazy load like that? That would be kind of interesting. Yeah, that's that was basically the technique yeah. I've started using. I don't have this quite ready to release yet, but I've started working on sort of a prototype starter kit kind of thing that's for paywalled content. And yeah, the part of the navigation bar where it says if you're signed in or not, the part of the page where it's like, oh, well, Below the first paragraph, the rest of this content should be behind the paywall. Like all that kind of stuff is all through like turbo frames and which parts of the page are the static page versus the dynamic route. And it can re-render the content, you know, through Bridgetown's template system, but dynamically. And (laughs) yeah, it's like this whole sort of constellation of things all kind of coming together into one unified idea. And it's really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the turbo stuff. So you were talking about how, I I don't know if this is just me thinking or seeing things, but like from what I have seen with the new Bridgetown, because I'm running my website 
on the beta version. So if you're looking for an example website, you can go on my GitHub, my website's there. And I use view components in it as well and ERB. So it seems a lot faster. And the resources, the new resource API, I like that a lot better than what it was previously, which I don't feel the need to explain right now. The ES build feels faster too. And to the point where I was like, this is getting like pretty quick. I want to see how fast could I deploy a website? So I started timing it and I ran the Bridgetown new demo and I used ERB, so dash T ERB and ran it and then deployed it to Vercel. And it literally, I timed it. It took 60 seconds. So that's your barrier to entry here. In 60 seconds, I had a live website, which is kind of incredible. At the beginning of the show, Jason was like, you gave us all a gift. And what you gave me was a curse <laughs> because I spend so much time playing with my Bridgetown site. It is the most fun I've had programming in years. <laughs> and all my free time is vanished completely. It's been amazing to see like coming from what could you do in Jekyll that you could also do with Bridgetown to now. It's like, I look at things like 11T and I'm like, there's nothing that they're doing in 11T that I cannot do in Bridgetown. And if you think there is, challenge me. <laughs> Let's go. What has that journey kind of been like from your perspective of like, where do you kind of see Bridgetown now versus what's in the future? So I don't know what personality type this is, but for whatever reason, every time out in the wild, I see any complaint of any sort with Ruby is slow or Ruby's hard to install or Ruby's not relevant for modern websites or you know, any of these sort of comments. I see that as a challenge. And I, I don't mean that in a like, let's go toe to toe. It's more like, well, how do we solve that? Well, how do we make Ruby faster? How do we make it easier to install? How do we make it more relevant to modern website development? Let's fix these problems if they're indeed problems, right? <laughs> so, I mean, on the speed front, there's only so much I can do personally because I'm somewhat at the behest of MRI and the speed of Ruby, but that keeps getting better. Ruby itself as a language keeps getting faster, even just architectures. I recently switched to doing most of my main development work on an M1 based Mac versus an Intel based Mac. And that alone, I was seeing speed ups of at least 15% just running Ruby stuff or node stuff or whatever. So there's that in terms of installation. A lot of what I see out there with issues with Ruby installation is usually because the installation instructions are not ideal or missing a step or they miss a step of the instructions because they're kind of confusing. So, you know, a big priority at Bridgetown is to have like the best installation guides kind of that we can come up with of like, here's how you make sure to install Ruby in the right way so that installing and running Bridgetown is really straightforward. And it seems to work. It definitely, I feel like the, the better those have gotten, the fewer times anyone comes along with I'm trying to run bundle and I'm getting this weird error and now I have to do sudo something and now I don't know what's happening and the thing's the right version. And <laughs> like, I just, yeah, I want to make sure we try to head all that stuff off at the pass. And then in terms of just in general, like where Ruby fits into the larger ecosystem. Yeah, it's just, I try to keep my nose to the grindstone with what's coming out there in terms of the kind of tools people are learning as beginners and the kind of languages and platforms people are getting started with and make sure Ruby is competitive there. If something like 11D gets popular and, and I actually think 11D is a really great project. You know, it's a JavaScript based static site generator and I think that's a great project and that's how a lot of people now, I think, get started if they're learning how to build a site and trying out a static side generator, they're trying out 11D. So if someone's hearing about Ruby as a language and thinking, oh, I want to try out Ruby, if they've used 11T and then thinking about Ruby, they go and try Jekyll. I think there's some areas where I hate to say it, but it's not going to be a very impressive switch. <laughs> they're probably going to run into some real roadblocks there and think, well, that was so easy in 11T. Like, I'll just go back to that, right? Or go back to Gatsby or go back to whatever. So I want to make sure there's tools out there in the landscape that are Ruby based that are also just really competitive and staying on top of things and pushing the envelope and helping make this scene better and easier for the most people. That's just what I'm really passionate about. And it's not always easy to figure out what to prioritize or what's the most 
urgent need in those different areas. But, you know, hopefully as the community grows, we'll get more of those signals and that feedback loop will continue to to function. So, yeah, it's been a really, I think, positive road for the most part so far, just in terms of the feedback we've gotten, because I've talked to quite a few people that are basically like, I was ready to give up on Ruby or I'm just starting to learn Ruby and I wasn't sure what to do or whatever. And Bridgetown is kind of like this gateway to this new world of having fun building websites and learning Ruby or relearning Ruby. As you guys can imagine, that's uh, the most exciting thing. You wrote a really good blog article about this, basically saying, I'm summarizing my interpretation of it, which may not be the interpretation that you intended, but my interpretation of it is like, Bridgetown is a great way to get a start with Ruby because you don't have to write a ton of Ruby if you don't want to, but if you want to, and I feel like I've had like a resurgence with Ruby ever since writing Bridgetown. And I want to echo like the sentiments that if you're a junior and you're like, I kind of want to like learn Ruby a little bit outside of like, obviously learning the fundamentals. I think Bridgetown is a great place to start trying things out because it's similar enough to Rails not in a sense of like the DSL or the API or anything, but similar in like you have views and like Bridgetown is backed by a concept of models. Conceptually, it's kind of similar. And I was talking to someone the other day, I was like, I haven't written a Rails app in my spare time in a long time because I've just been writing a ton of Ruby and doing things with Ruby in Bridgetown. And so, yeah, I just want to echo that. I feel like Bridgetown is a great place, even just experiment. Because one thing that I've been doing a lot of is like, I have all these opinions about how components should be used. And instead of trying them at Podia and crashing the app, I take them and do them all in Bridgetown. And I like exercise like my ideas and like, oh, well, how would a view look like if we architected like this with view components and what are the best arguments and all this stuff? So I just want to argue that I've talked to a lot of people in the Bridgetown Discord who are like, oh, I don't really know Ruby or this is kind of like my first time. And that's really encouraging. Yeah, honestly, that's what gets me up in the morning. That's the best thing about this is, you know, talking about just general like education around programming languages. I think it's sort of an obvious and natural thing when you go look at a tutorial about a language that they're like type this code into this script file and then your command line run language name and then the file and it will run the file and you'll get something in your terminal. Okay, cool. But this is the era where everybody wants to just immediately jump into doing something cool and putting it out on the web, right? You know, you want to try out some new CSS framework. You want to try out some new uh, JavaScript thing that animates something on your page or WebGL, whatever. Like there's all this fun stuff that seems more exciting than like, oh, look, I got some numbers output in my terminal, right? <laughs> so in terms of learning things, I think the more we can kind of steer people into like, hey, here's how to build a little web page that does this cool thing that looks really neat. You can share with everybody. And in the process of building that, you can also learn a little bit of Ruby and use that. I think that approach to education can really sell this language (laughs) better to people who are new to this. And you see that in other ecosystems, right? Apple has Swift Playgrounds. You know, you can load it up on your iPad and immediately start typing a little bit of Swift and you're creating a video game on your iPad or something fun like that. And I would just love to see more things in that direction for Ruby in terms of educational materials and tools and all of that. I think we can maybe see some of that with the WebAssembly stuff with Ruby because I tried to do that a couple of years ago where we could just like run Ruby in a browser and like make it fun. And one of my friends who is actually like the brains of the operation helped me do that. And it was like a unofficially supported attempt at it. But now Ruby is working to do that. I think like being able to run Ruby in a browser would help people just dive in and have fun with it and like get their feet wet. And then they can transition to things like Bridgetown, stuff like that. Yeah, the web assembly stuff is fascinating because, yeah, we have some sort of interesting, sometimes really cool ways of sort of writing Ruby that can run the browser. You know, there's the Opal project, which is almost an entire implementation of the Ruby language that then transpiles to JavaScript. And that's really cool. But it's also this like really heavy part of the stack that I don't think a lot of people can justify adding that to sort of a production general 
purpose website. And then there's also Ruby to JS, which I actually have been contributing to a bit lately, which is sort of a more lightweight idea of like, what if you were writing JavaScript, but the syntax of what you're writing is almost exactly Ruby. <laughs> so if you're writing document.query selector and doing add event listener and stuff like that, you would write that as if it's a Ruby API that you're writing with Ruby. And it's really kind of fascinating. Again, you know, necessarily going to be something you can sell to a ton of people on production projects, but at least for sort of personal one-off things or something you have full control over as a solo dev or whatever. I think it's awesome. But yeah, I think, you know, the ultimate dream, of course, would be something like WebAssembly that helps you write some truly genuine Ruby code that can then get compiled into a little bytecode file and sent off to the browser. That would be so cool. I kind of did not explain my point well either. The reason I was talking about WebAssembly is to like if there are ways that somebody has already compiled it, so like beginners can just go learn Ruby syntax, like in the browser kind of thing, like without having to install it. I think that's fascinating. Like, is there a tool that lets us just write a class, instantiate it, hit run and get an output? I think that kind of stuff, like, because yeah. like somebody, yeah. somebody mentioned earlier, people might get stuck getting Ruby set up. I think it's that hard to do on a laptop. The other cool thing that's happened just, in terms of general stuff in the ecosystem is I'm really excited about everything GitHub's been doing with GitHub code spaces. You can actually spin up the Bridgetown repo itself in code spaces and run tests and write stuff and submit a PR without ever installing anything on your own machine. I mean, you can probably do all that from an iPad because this is all running in the cloud. So, so also just especially for the newbies, you don't even have to have a fast machine and install a bunch of stuff and figure out why your GCC tool chain is having some weird error and, oh, you need to install Git to and this and that. Like you can just basically click a button on a web browser and start typing a little code or paste it in and run. And yeah, I think all that stuff is going to be a force multiplier <laughs> in the industry as a whole to just really make it easier for people to get on board. So as we're getting close on time, what else do we not cover about Bridgetown V1 that people should know? I think we're getting to a pretty good place in terms of the APIs are stable. The pace of changing things has slowed down from the sort of rapid frenzy that it was a few months ago. And all that means that it's becoming easier for outside contributors to really kind of feel like they're safe <laughs> to contribute or to offer suggestions and especially documentation, right? Like some of the new stuff is documented, I think pretty well, but then there's other places where there's big gaps. So if you try out Bridgetown and there's something that just is really confusing or doesn't make sense or something you might think is a bug, even if you think it's just you and not really a bug, like still, please let us know. I think we mentioned before, there's a Discord chat. So we're all pretty active on there and lots of people sharing tips and ideas there, which is cool. But yeah, just uh, as much as possible. I love hearing from the community and getting feedback, whether that's positive feedback or help. This seems totally broken and I don't know what's happening. It's all good. So yeah. I just want to say thank you for me personally. Because of you, I've had so much freaking fun in my like nights and weekends like playing with this that it's made me like re-fall in love with programming again. And like the web in general. So from that perspective, I thank you because I you've brought a lot of joy to my life. Also a lot of pain. We'll talk about that later. It was also because of you that I learned about Webpack, which actually ended up being pretty beneficial down the road. But if you haven't been convinced to like try Bridgetown yet, please try it. Join the community. I'm happy to help anyone personally. Like if you reach out to me and you want to build a Bridgetown site, I'm happy to help you pair with you or whatever, because I have so much fun doing it. And it's so much easier to help someone else build it than it is to tweak mine because I'm like, but the color. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I mean, I feel like you're making a great impact on the community and I thank you for it. I love hearing that. That's awesome. You've reminded me that I think, Andrew, you and I were fiddling with porting my Jekyll site over to Bridgetown like way back when. And I need to finish that finally because it has just sat there the same Jekyll site for like eight years or whatever. And I'm like, 
I don't ever feel like updating it. And I mean, Jekyll is not really stayed and allows the same kind of ease of like, I want to throw ES build in there and use the same stuff I'm using in, in my Rails sites. So I need to go finish that. It's a good reminder, a good nudge to get that done finally after, I don't know, it was like a year ago when we touched that or something. You just let me know. I feel like now I could do it really quickly. Yeah. Um, 60 seconds, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, hey, just saying, yeah. we have a built-in Tailwind configuration that you can run. So it just like installs everything. Boom. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Because I believe that I like wrote custom CSS for everything on my Jekyll site way back when. Because I didn't want Bootstrap, but there was nothing really else at the time. And I was like, yeah, I'll just do that myself. And I'm not good at writing CSS or like organizing it well. It was gnarly. So it'd be much better to slap the new version together with some Tailwind. So, yeah, I should mention real quick just a blank site, Bridgetown Ship Swift is just a very tiny little CSS style sheet just to have something that you're supposed to overwrite. But with a just basically an extra command line flag, you can install Tailwind and down the road, probably Bootstrap and maybe one or two other obvious things. So you know, again, the goal is to help people get started really fast. Scriptaculous, jQuery, coffee scripts. <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> maybe we should uh, end up spending some weekends just making PRs for like completely ridiculous if features for Rails and Bridgetown and whatever, just for fun. April's hey. coming up. Just saying. This is my Blink component. I love it. Well, if there's nothing else, Jared, you said in the beginning, but where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find me on GitHub at Jared C. White and also Twitter, my website, is jaredwhite.com and Bridgetown site is bridgetownrb.com. Do you have any guesstimation of when V1 will be officially released? I'm hoping by the end of February, somewhere around there. At this point, it's largely just making sure there's no show stopping bugs, nothing really weird going on. So again, feedback from the community here is really important, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good about where we are. So, nice. Yeah. It's in a very different place than when you started. And I think what you've kind of come up with is perfect. In the beginning, like all the things I was like, well, I can't really do this and I can't really figure out this. And now all of those problems are gone. And like I said, I feel like I could build anything in Bridgetown now within reason. Thank you so much for all you're doing in the community and jump in the Bridgetown Discord and try it out and let us know. So thank you, Jared, so much for coming on the show. Oh, sure. Thanks again for having me. This is awesome. Yeah. And I think we'll see you at RailsConf this year, right? Yeah. I don't have anything specific to say yet, but let's just say I'm hoping that any Bridgetown fans that come to RailsConf will be able to, to have some fun hanging out together. Yeah. You need to get that brand new shiny logo on a shirt so I can wear it around. Yeah. Make a sticker pack or something. Yeah. Well, try out BridgetownRB.com. Jared, thank you so much. And to the rest of you, we will talk to you soon. Sounds good. See you next week.